Welcome back to another episode of Optimal Game State. Last week we looked at the infantry in Legions Imperialis. So today we're going to be looking at the vehicles. Hopefully by now you've managed to get your hand on the game and have the rulebook beside you. I did get mine, and I'm slowly working through the infantry, would have had 100 marines sitting on my painting desk as we speak. Unlike last week, we're not going to be looking at the basics of the rules, which are largely unchanged for vehicles, but we will be talking a little bit about special rules. The first set of profiles we're going to look at are the tanks. These are relatively simple vehicles and are basically going to move, point a gun, and fire. Remember that anything with a light weapon trait is unable to damage any vehicles in this category or higher, and that was the majority of the infantry, apart from the occasional missile launcher. The first profile we're going to look at is the Legion Predator. Move 9 is much faster than the infantry, who typically move 5. The save of 3 plus is also much better. Close Assault Factor is plus 2, which is the same as the Assault Marines, and as this is just one wound, it will die just as easily in melee. So infantry swarming tanks in melee might be a good strategy to get around their ranged weapons not being able to deal with it. This does make some sense. You often see infantry pop out of the Humvees in movies to keep people at a distance. They might not be able to beat a tank's armour, but up close you can, you know, pop a grenade down an air shaft or something like that. There are four weapons the Predator can have. The main turret can be a cannon or a las cannon. The side sponsons can be heavy bolters or las cannons. The cannon and the heavy bolters are more focused on clearing infantry, while the las cannons are better against enemy tanks. The turret cannons are similar, both have minus one AP. Predator has two dice, but the las cannon gets to reroll misses with that accurate trait. The cannon's light AP means it works against infantry and vehicles, but loses the AP against vehicles. The las cannon's anti-tank is a reverse. It loses AP against infantry, but is useful for versus both. I think the Laz Cannon probably has the advantage here with a slightly better to hit roll of 4+. Plus. For the Sponsons, the Laz Cannons are extra punch for the main Laz Cannon, making this a dedicated tank killer. The Heavy Bolters are light, so infantry only, but they do have point defences, which means, among other things, they can target another target than the main attack. When building your Predators, you can leave the turrets unglued and switch between them, which is pretty nice. The Sponsons, not so much. I'm tempted to say go with the Heavy Bolters, as infantry will always be a thing, but I honestly suspect people won't mind if you run a different profile to what you have modelled, as long as you're clear about it ahead of time. Next up, we have the Lehman Russ, a little slower than the Predator, but with better armour of 2+. CAF is the same, and morale is a little worse. Again, we get to pick two of the four weapons. This time it's two variants of Battle Cannon as a primary, with the exact same secondaries as we had in the Predator. The normal battle cannon has no special traits, which means it's good at killing infantry and tanks. The Vanquisher, on the other hand, has an even longer range of 32, has minus 2 AP and armor bane, so it's better range than the last cannon on the Predator, has better AP, and gives up accurate for armor bane. So instead of re-rolling misses, it forces the defender to re-roll saves, which is probably just as good. Unlike the Predator, the Lehman Rust does have some special rules. The first is the chain of command, which means they can only get advance orders unless there is a commander nearby. The second is the explorator adaptation, which gives a 6 plus invul against barrage or blast. We haven't really seen those kind of weapons yet, but we're expecting to see them on artillery. Again, I believe the turret options can be boat built and left unglued to switch, while the hull mounted secondary weapon is probably a bit too fiddly to magnetize. I do quite like the idea of the Vanquishers outranging the Predators, taking pot shots at them while they can't be shot back. Then the hull mounted uh, heavy bolters with its point defense can be used to scare infantry. Next up, we have the Legion Sicarian. The core profile here is the same as Predator, but it's slightly faster. What are two weapons picked from four? We have three weapons picked from five. You will always have the hull mounted heavy bolter, which has the exact same stats as we saw earlier, as do the sponsor weapons. So we'll focus here on the primary weapons. We have the twin-linked accelerator autocannon and the Omega Plasma Array. Both are relatively short range with 16 to 12 inches. We don't have any of those limiting traits like light or anti-tank, so these weapons will work just as well against anything void mat. Both are minus one AP and have multiple dice, but the autocannon is three dice at five plus, while the plasma array is two dice at four plus. We've already seen accurate, that's reroll misses, but tracking is new. It gives rerolls specifically against flyers, so typically accurate is going to be better. Again, 
I believe you can make both turrets switch between them, but in this case, I suspect the Amiga Plasma Ray is going to be better. Two dice hitting on a 4 plus with rerolls is going to be better than three dice on 5 pluses with, without rerolls. Same dilemma with the sponsons more LAS cannons to take out enemy tanks, or heavy boulders to take out infantry. I'm tempted to say go with the heavy boulders just to limit the attack pools to just two sets of dice. They will combine with a hull mounted one to give four dice versus infantry. As the range of the plasma array is quite short at 12 inches, it will be good to be able to clear enemy infantry out, as this tank will really have to get stuck in on the action. Going back to the auxilia, we have the Malkador, which has a massive list of options. Again, we have three gun slots, but each have three options each for a totally bewildering array of combinations. The main profile is similar to the Predator, but the morale is a little worse. Importantly, the wounds are now two, so the Malkadors can take a hit and keep going. The Battle Cannon and the Vanquisher are the same as the Le Mans Russ, but uh, fixed forward facing. The Last Cannon is similar to the Predator, but again, forward facing. It also gets an extra dice, which is nice. The Sponsons and Hull Mount weapons are, for the most part, similar to what we've seen before. The Hull Mounted Demolisher Cannon, though, is a new addition and has some special rule of note. We did see the Ignore's cover when looking at the infantry. It's a great option for dealing with targets garrisoned in buildings or buying to train. Of maybe more interest is the Demolisher trait, which lets the weapon do damage to structures. So this can try take down buildings. That could be good. Notably, out of all of these weapons, only the heavy bolters have point defense. Without that special trait, everything must target the same enemy. So keep that in mind when working out how to assign your weapons. I think the best approach here is either to match it with the primary weapon or go with the heavy bolters to get uh, secondary targets. All the previous entries we've seen have been battle tanks. With the Kratos, we're getting into the heavy tanks, although this is still just a vehicle of scale 2 and not yet one of the super heavies you see at scale 3. For the basic profile, the Kratos is similar to the Malkador, but with that better Legion morale. Again, we have three weapon slots to pick from. The hull mounted and sponsored weapons are similar to what we've seen before. Keep in mind, you do get two hull mounted weapons, but the weapon profile is only for one, so whatever you do, you get to go and double the dice. The turret has two slots, one of which will always be the coaxial autocannon. Unless I'm missing something here, the coaxial rule is a bit wasted here. The idea is that the coaxial has to target the same target as the main gun, so the gun just before it. But unless there's some special rule that says otherwise, all weapons will have to target a single target anyway. Apart from that, it is two dice with a five plus to hit and a minus one AP against vehicles, but not infantry. For the main weapon, there are two choices, the Kratos Battle Cannon or the Melta Blast Gun. The battle Cannon has two firing modes, which is always nice to see. The first is 20 range, two dice, four plus with minus one AP and no special rules. That seems good against most things. Once we get it within 10 inches, we can switch to the closer range option, which is only one dice, but is minus four AP and has armor vein. This is a real tank killer. The other option is the Melta Blast Gun, which has a very close range of eight inches and is the same as a close range battle cannon apart from that. The only difference is it does work against infantry and also has a bunker buster special rule, which lets it destroy structures and doubles the AP against them. So that would be minus eight AP against a building, which is super, super good and probably more armored than the Civitas buildings that we currently see have. Switching the turret weapons on this is a little trickier, but I have seen people do it. Rather than two different turrets, the casing above the main gun can be lifted off and the weapon underneath switched out. And then you have a bunch of magnets all everything in place. As to how to feel this, I'm not entirely sure myself. The battle cannon and the last cannons would make this a pretty scary tank hunter. Similarly, the blast gun looks like it's good for digging out garrisoned infantry, while a full set of heavy bolters would be six dice, which could get a lot of work done. Last in the tank section, we have the super heavy option for the auxilia. This is kind of what makes them special. Move seven, making it the slowest move we've seen, two plus, which is as good as it can get, and again, we're seeing those two wounds. Morale is four plus, as we've come to expect with auxilia, while close assault factor is plus four, doubling the plus two we've been seeing with the rest of the tanks. We have a ton of weapons. This time we're seeing four distinct weapon points. Last cannons on the sponsor turrets, two hull mounted weapons with a demolisher and heavy bolter, two turret weapons, a coaxial auto cannon with either demolisher or hellhammer, and then sponsor weapons, either heavy bolters, auto cannon, or heavy flamers. This time we've got a ton of point defense weapon options. 
with all the sponsons having it along with the hull mounted heavy boulder. The main blade is a universal problem solver with range 25 and minus 3 AP. The hell hammer is actually similar but at half the range. As a bonus, you get Demolisher and it ignores cover. So you can either go around the building or just straight through it. The hull mounted Demolisher cannon does similar. We do get a few options here with the flamers, which are point defense, so you can target a tank with the main gun and still incinerate infantry. This is two dice at four plus, ignoring cover, but they still get their normal save. Again, this is a bewildering array of options. You're always going to have the coaxial auto cannon, the las cannon spawns and turrets, the demolisher cannon, and the hull mounted heavy bolter. So you're just picking out the main gun and the sponsons. I'm tempted to go at heavy bolters again just for the sheer joy of rolling lots of dice, while the main cannon seems the most flexible. We'll have to see how the garrisoning impacts the gameplay, as having the options for the Hellhammer to destroy buildings and the Flamers to clear them out could be a good counterplay. And that was all the tanks. We've kept the Rhinos in reserve for the transport section later in the video. Next up we're going to be looking at some flyers. These have their own set of rules, all wrapped up in a couple of traits. First of course is the flyer trait. At the start of the game, flyers are not deployed and instead stay in reserve. A flyer in reserve can only be given the advance or march order. When you activate them in the movement phase, you place them with the rear of the base at the board edge. Now that can be your deployment board edge or any point within 8 inches of your board edge. The flyer then moves in a straight line and can move once up to 90 degrees during that movement. They can move over models and terrain. After that movement, they will be on the board ready for the combat phase. As they are in the air, they are considered to have line of sight to all models, and all models have line of sight to them. They can't control objectives. Hitting them is hard. It will require a 6+. plus. During the end phase, they are removed from the board and head back to reserve for another run next turn. There is one exception to this. If they have the hover special rule, they can stay on the board, but they lose the flyer trait and gain skimmer trait instead. On later turns, they can choose to lose that skimmer trait and go back to flyer just before flyers are removed from the board. A skimmer can move over terrain and models, but can't end their movement overlapping. During first fire stage, they can do what's called a pop-up attack. This lets them trace their line of sight from 10 inches above their current position. They will stay that way until the end of the fire stage though, so enemies do get a chance to fire back. Okay, first up we have the lightning flyer. No CF, no morale, which is something we're going to see across all of these. But it's got a speedy 30 move, along with a 4 plus save and a single wound. At the bottom we have a few special rules. We've already mentioned Flyer. Interceptor is new. This lets the model take a bonus attack at the end of its move with a single weapon against an enemy Flyer, but it gets a minus 2 penalty. Now we can see the weapons above have 4 plus at best, so these shots are going to be on a 6 plus. It is a bonus attack though and you can still fire with the same weapon later, so there really is no downside to it. The last special ability is Jink of 5+, plus, which is essentially an invul save. You do need to move to get it, so a first fire order means you lose the Jink save, but this lightning is never going to have that order as an option. The primary weapons are a twin las cannon or a twin multi-laser. Range is a factor here, but as the lightning is arriving at the board edge, moves 30 inches, and the board size is going to be normally around 48 inches deep. Range shouldn't really be a problem. The choice here essentially is whether you want to go after infantry or tanks. The LAS cannon is anti-tank, so it loses the minus 1 AP against infantry. The multi-laser is light AT, so it loses its AP against vehicles. But it doesn't have any AP anyway. So you're going to get more hits with the multi-laser, but the LAS cannon does have a little bit of AP. These both have the Skyfire trait, which lets them target aircraft normally, so it doesn't have those sixes to hit. Skyfire also lets us have a second target as long as it's a flyer. So we can drop the Hellstrike missiles onto a tank as a primary target and use those last cannons against an enemy flyer as a secondary target. We then have the three underwing weapons. So that's the Hellstrike missiles, the Skystrike missiles, and the Phosphex bomb cluster. We will see these, or variations of them, repeated across various aircraft. The Hellstrikes are straightforward vehicle killers. Armor Bane means successful saves by the enemy must be rerolled. Sky Strike missiles are anti aircraft. Tracking means that misses against a flyer can be rerolled. You can, of course, use these against ground targets, but then they're basically the same as the Hellstrike but without the Armor Bane. 
last are the Phosphex bomb clusters, which I think are very interesting. They have rear arc and no range. So basically you fly over the target and then you know pick the location within that route. This is all wrapped up in the bombing run trait. This does happen during the movement phase, so you resolve it straight away during that. They are particularly good against garrison troops. It has the ignore cover rule, and the bombing run trait lets you do damage to both the infantry and the building at the same time. So you essentially target the building, which takes normal damage, and then every detachment within the building gets half dice rolled against them. So in this case, you'd roll two dice against the building and one dice against every detachment in it. Next up, we have the Avenger Strike Fighter. Slightly slower than a Lightning, but better armed. Here, we always have that nose bolt cannon, and we always have the rear mounted heavy stubber. The bolt cannon has rapid fire, so a six will count as two hits. With five dice, there's a pretty good chance of getting at least one. It's light anti tank, so that minus one AP only works against infantry. The heavy stubber has point defense, which means it can attack additional targets, or you can use it uh, after movement with Overwatch. Both Skyfire and Point Defense weapons talk about a secondary target. You might interpret that to mean a second target, or you might interpret that to mean an additional target. Point Defense's rule specifically says that all Point Defense weapons must target the same target. So that to me suggests that you could have your primary target, a secondary target with the Heavy Stubbers, Point Defense, and a third target with Skyfire. From Aeronautica, the Heavy Stubber would only target aircraft on the same level or higher than it. You can kind of see that from a model. But we don't have that rule here. So I'm expecting Avenger pilots to be flying upside down so they can target ground troops or similar. The primary bolt cannon is supported with either a LAS cannon or an auto cannon. The auto cannon is similar to the bolt cannon but without the rapid fire. The LAS cannon has less dice but better range and hits on a 4 plus rather than a 5 plus. Again, I'd be tempted to match the bolt cannon with the auto cannon so you've got similar range and hit values. We have those same special rules uh, with the same underwing weapon options, although the bomb wings are slightly different. When it comes to the models, the kit will have lots of options. In Aeronautica, typically people ignored whatever was modeled underneath the wing and went by the cards instead. If you're worried about it, you could model without anything and say it's been modeled after the options have been fired. Alternatively, it is possible to magnetize them with uh, one millimeter by one millimeter magnets but it is a bit fiddly to do. The star of the Imperial Navy is, of course, the Thunderbolt. It is a little bit slower at 25, and that might be a factor for the bombs if you run them, but with the range 16, you're going to be able to move from the board edge and target pretty much anything you want on the table anyway, so it's not too much of an issue. The save is still 4+, plus, so the real difference here is going to be in the weapons. The quad auto cannons are the same as the Avengers, uh, as are the LAS cannons. This time, though, you do get both. You can upgrade the auto cannons to a bolt cannon for a small point increase. Again, this is uh, similar to the version you've got in the Avenger. So overall, it's, uh, it's quite similar to the Avenger. Next up, we have the Xiphon Interceptor, the first of the Legion aircrafts, and it's a bit of a beast. At move 30, it is as fast as the Lightning. It's also got a better save than any of the previous aircraft with a 3+. There are no options for weapons. You get what you get. That's a LAS cannon ray and missile launchers, both quite similar. The LAS cannon is anti-tank, which just means it's worse at infantry, while the missiles are equally good against both. LAS cannons get re-rolled with accurate, but the missiles get re-rolled versus enemy aircraft with tracking. Both have skyfire, which means they roll to hit as normal against enemy aircraft and can be split for a secondary fire. So each is two dice with four plus to hit and re-rolls with a minus one AP. With that Interceptor Special Rule, you're going to be able to get double duty on one of those as well. So essentially you've got six dice here. That's pretty good. Unlike the Navy, there are no underwing uh, mount options though. Next we have the Fire Raptor. Again, we have that better save of 3+, plus, and it's still fast enough with 25 move. This has an Avenger Bolt Cannon in the nose, Tempest Rockets under the wings, and a selection of options for the batteries. When you're building this, you can stick magnets in the body of the craft before you seal it up. Then you could put a ball bearing in the turrets before you seal them up. That lets you switch out the turrets in and out, and they'll still rotate, which is kind of fun. Again, we're seeing a lot of sky fire here, which means you can pick secondary aircraft as targets. But I'm probably more interested in the quad heavy boulder batteries, which also have point defense. That's because I see the Fire Raptor as a support craft, using the hover rule to sit on the board 
and help out to move below. While that might seem right in my head, I'm not sure if it's necessarily the right call. Hover, as we've mentioned before, lets us switch the flyer rule to skimmer and not leave the battle at the end of the turn. That will let us give the Fire Raptor a first fire order, which they couldn't otherwise get. We do lose a lot of mobility doing that though. Keeping aircraft in reserve at the end of the turn lets us place them exactly where we want them. On the other hand, being able to first fire could let us take out key enemy before they have a chance to fire themselves. This is going to be quite expensive though, but the good news is we have a bucket of dice to roll. Uh, it's between 8 and 10 dice depending on what weapons you pick. Last out of this selection of flyers, we'll have a few more later, we have the Marauder Bomber. This one is a bit weird. It is essentially a dedicated bomber, but it does have numerous different options. Where the previous aircraft would have wing bombs, this has a bomb bay built into it. This means we are going to want to fly over our target. We have last cannons pointing forward and heavy bolters fit pointing backwards. So if you try to get into a position where you can maximize your targets, yeah, that's going to be pretty tricky. It does have that better 3 plus save, which we've seen with the Legion aircraft, and with 24 move, it is the slowest we've seen so far. You do get to pick two from the underwing options, and notably you can double up. So you can take two wing bombs and drop a total of six dice of the buildings, all with two, minus two AP, which is very likely to destroy a building. It means anyone inside would take three dice worth of damage each. And then they have to deal with the building exploding and whatever else that does. There are also a couple of variants of Marauder. The Colossus gives up the Laz Cannon Ray at the front, replacing it with a Bolter turrets, which is the same profile as the rear. It then upgrades the bomb bay to a Colossus bomb, which is a one use only. So that's six dice, three plus eight, minus four AP. It has bombing run and bunker buster, which doubles the AP against structure. As we mentioned before, we're living in a Civitas world currently, so this is probably going to be a bit overkill. But if we ever do get to see major fortifications turn up in the game, this could be a way of dealing with them. Another variant is the Pathfinder, which gives up the bomb bay. It switches the last cannons for bolters, and in exchange for this, it gets the Augur Array, which lets barrage weapons in the detachment ignore the minus one penalty for indirect fire. That might become important once we actually get some batteries. The Pathfinder would essentially be a aerial spotter to give all of your basilisks, I guess, or whatever batteries we eventually do see for the Auxilia. They'll all have that advantage would be pretty cool. Finally, and uh, this is my own personal favorite, we have the Marauder Destroyer variant. It costs 10 more points, but trades the nose las cannons for the auto cannon ray and adds the assault cannons. Combined, there are nine dice in total and light AT, which means they only get the minus one against infantry. This makes the destroyer a pretty great infantry killer, and it still has the bomb bay and wing mount options. I figure it'll be a good problem solver. I definitely see this as kind of A10 war tog of this game, and look forward to making the appropriate noises as I tear into the enemy. All right, and that was all of the flyers. And yes, we have missed a few. And that's because we're going to have them listed in the transport section. There are four transport special traits. Transport, assault transport, large transport, and large assault transport. After each is the number of brackets, this is the number of infantry bases each one can hold. Your infantry can start the game in their transports. But if any of the infantry bases from a detachment deploy in transports, then all of the infantry from that detachment must be in transports. And those transports must all come from a single detachment of transports. So, if you've got a tactical detachment and you wanted to have it in rhinos, everyone in that tactical detachment must be in a rhino, and all of those rhinos must be in the same detachment. So you can't split them up, and you can't have you know half of your tactical marines on foot from that same detachment. You can have different attachments in your overall formation with some in transports and others not. Things can get a bit messy later when you start taking losses. If you end up in a weird position where you don't have enough transports for all the infantry, you can mount some of them, but the entire unit still has to stay in coherency. Even though they are in the transport, infantry will get orders as normal, but they can only get the advance or march order. 
to disembark from a transport, the infantry detachment chooses to do so during the transport's activation in the movement phase. I think you can activate infantry and transports, which seems a little bit weird to me. Do all the Marines stick their bolters out the window and shoot? I'm, I'm not sure. If you've got an idea, please do let me know in the comments. Once they do disembark, they can then activate if they haven't already. So you can get a march order with your transport and a march order with your infantry, zooming them across the board. The transports will often have guns as well though, so there are reasons to go with advance in kind of both sections. One good thing about them is they will be able to add some support after they've deployed their troops, which is nice. If for some reason transports do start getting destroyed while troops are in it, each infantry makes a 4 plus save or takes a wound. Anyone who survives is deployed within 2 inches of the destroyed transport. That's all the transport basics. If you upgrade to an assault transport, you can also include bulky infantry, and you can assign the charge order in addition to the advance and march. For the large transport, you can also add walkers, and again bulky models. Bulky only takes up one slot in this case, while walkers count as two. The large assault transport is the best of both worlds, so it's the same as a large transport, but you can assign the charge order as well as the advance and march. Alright, let's go look at some actual examples. The first here is the classic Rhino, so move 9, save is 4+, plus, one wound. It does have twin linked bolters, so it can add a little bit of fire, but not much. Honestly, these are kind of infantry level weapons, and it's very similar to a normal bolter. So I can think we can think of this as more of a way to expand out your infantry attachment. It makes them faster, and you still get an extra bolter for similar points. Initially, I was thinking I wouldn't upgrade them and would keep them cheap, but there might be cases where they're carrying a detachment with a specific task, or it might be a good way to deal with problems that the infantry can't handle. That said, my gut says that we could probably keep it cheap. Speaking of which, this is where we have the Arvis Lighter. Unfortunately, these are in resin and are pretty expensive for two, but on the table, they're a super cheap 12 points that can turn your infantry into flyers. This can carry two infantry, so you need two of these for even a basic four base attachment. They won't start in play, but you can have them suddenly appear and then drop in. So one moment they'll be in reserve, and the next moment you're deploying your infantry attachment to position. There is a special rule with flying deployments. The transport must have a hover, and when it deploys, it loses flyer for the rest of the turn. So this is going to drop in and deploy, and then stick around until the end of the next turn, when it can then be removed as a normal flyer. You could keep it on the table and use it to ferry other troops around, which might be useful. Be careful though, if a flyer is destroyed with troops in it, they don't get a save, they're just destroyed. The Storm Eagle is then a step up from this. Now, we have transport of five, and we can finally add an entire detachment into one transport. Usually groups will be in twos, so you will end up leaving one slot free. You can of course add more Storm Eagles to round things out, or you can use that extra slot for a single base like a Legion Commander. So it is possible to have multiple attachments in the same transport. For weapons, you do get everything here. The main heavy bolter is worse than the bolt cannon on the Fire Raptor, but the last cannons are similar. So you're kind of trading out a little bit of firepower, but not a massive amount, to get that assault of Assault Transport 5. And it is assault. That means you can deploy your assault troops with their bulky backpacks, and they can take the charge order. So this is a pretty impressive way to get your close combat troops into the fray. As a bonus, the jump packs mean the Storm Eagle never needs to actually stop and hover. Instead, it can fly off again and be back in reserve for next turn. Then, lastly, we have the Big Daddy, the Thunderhawk gunship. Like the Storm Eagle, it comes as is. So it's got a 2 plus save and 2 wounds, basically a heavy tank, and has the firepower to back it up. The main turbo laser is range 40, 3 dice, 4 plus accurate with minus 3 AP. The Hellstrike missiles are going to go after the same target, then the last cannon can use the Sky Strike to target an aircraft while the heavy bolters use point defense target infantry. This is a large assault transport, so you can deploy four walkers in it. This could be a great way to drop four dreadnoughts straight into the action. Alternatively, it is a host of tactical troops who can go straight into key buildings all objectives. Then the Thunderhawk can get back to killing things. Probably cruising around with the skimmer rule and basically just acting like a big tank. And that's it. We managed to get through all of the vehicles out so far for Legion Imperialis. 
We still have the Titans and Knights to go, but mm, that can be something for later. I hope you enjoy this. What essentially was me reading through and then connecting all the dots from the various rules. I don't really have any big conclusions about what you should or should not field, as honestly I've got no idea. But I do feel I've learned a lot about what the various models in this game can and cannot do. As I said at the start of the video, I have managed to get my boxes, so I've currently got through the little men partially painted to work on. Please do comment if you've got any thoughts on the game. I'm hoping I'll be able to get everything ready for my first game sometime after the holidays, but I'm still super eager to work out how everything works. Thanks for making it all the way to the end. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Each week I put up a new video talking about one of Games Workshop's specialist games. The goal is always to try and make the best possible two-player experience. If this is something you'd find interesting, please subscribe to the channel and comment to let me know what you'd like to see in future.